Hi, I'm Karen Launchbaugh. I'm a professor of rangeland ecology at the University of Idaho, and I've spent most of my professional career trying to understand what animals eat and why they eat it. That led me to quite a bit of work in what's now called targeted grazing, where we're trying to manage what and how much animals eat. And that's very useful in, creating, in accomplishing landscape goals like weed control, and it's also very important and a good tool to use in managing fuels on wild ends. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we might apply targeted grazing to manage wildland fuels and hopefully affect the fire regimes that we're dealing with in the West. Okay, I said I was going to talk about great targeted grazing, but just remember, grazing is not grazing is not grazing. I'm reminded um, by what my colleague Barry Perryman says. Dr. Perryman says, remember that grazing is a verb. It's not a noun. It changes a lot depending on when it's applied, how much is applied, with what species it's applied. And here I'm going to kind of spread out. It also determines on what your goal is. Traditionally, kind of traditional grazing management was really focused at producing livestock. So that's what I would call managed grazing. Certainly it kept an eye on the range, but the goal was livestock production. Uh, when we started studying grazing uh, effects on ranch, I would think we went into this era called prescribed grazing, where we're looking at both the animal and we're putting a little more focus on the land, making sure the land is healthy and that those effects are really promoting the, the ecological condition of the land. As you move to conservation grazing, the primary goal becomes the conservation of the land, the ecological status of the land, and the livestock production is still important, but they're really a tool to accomplish land condition. If you move on over to the right hand side, then you get to targeted grazing where the absolute primary goal is the landscape goal. Um, I'm going to talk about all levels of grazing, but to put targeted grazing in context, um, remember that targeted grazing is a very specific kind of livestock at a very determined season and duration and intensity to accomplish a defined landscape goal. I think targeted grazing is interesting because it's a very unique uh, mix and an inherent mix of plant ecology and animal ecology. To do it well, you got to understand both the plant and the animal. On the plant side, you got to know when to accomplish grazing uh, so that it will meet your goals of perhaps weed suppression or in this case fire. You also need, to, I mean, fuel um, reduction. You also need to know how much, how intense, what stocking rate you'd use, and how frequently you should use it. You manage those landscape characteristics with animals, so you got to understand what's the species, what breed is cor is correct for the goal, for the project, what's the background or experience of the animal. Even body condition makes a lot of difference, and of course age does. So as a, a good targeted grazer, you got to understand both the plant and the animal side of the coin. So where does grazing fit into the idea of fuel management? Well, of course, grazing can directly reduce the amount of fuel, which has an inherent effect on the fire and then on the range ecosystem. But grazing also could have an effect on the plants. Specifically, I'm going to focus on invasive plants and invasive grasses. But in different ecosystems, there might be other uh, plant effects and community effects uh, that also would affect the range ecosystem. So where does targeted grazing fit in? And uh, what I'm going to show you today is I'm really just going to focus on about three major factors. One is how can grazing be used to create fuel breaks and maintain them? Secondly, uh, just going to the fuel reduction, but focusing on not just the amount, but also the continuity of fuels and how that might influence fire intensity. And then finally, um, we'll look at how grazing could be used to manage annual grasses. So I'm going to put this all in one package with those three pieces. Before we go there, let's think about grazing, where it fits into that fuel management, um, you know, the fuel management model. This was a, a figure put together by Dr. Ava Strand and I a few years ago to emphasize one really important point. Uh, fire spread severity intensity is affected by th three things at least. One is a bunch of factors that, infl are, that the weather influences the fire. Grazing has no effect on the weather. And then there's th these landscape feature features that affect the fire spread and intensity, like the slope, the aspect, even the heterogeneity of the landscape. Now, again, grazing doesn't affect that, but grazing can affect several fuel characteristics. Um, it could affect mostly the fuel amount is what we think of. We're learning a lot more about fuel continuity. Um, also, whether the ecosystem is primarily herbaceous or woody, we can change that depending on what kind of species we use as a grazing animal. 
We're learning also a lot more about how live dead ratios can be altered by grazing. And the, probably the most important part about that is we're learning that that influences fuel mo moisture, which of course influences the, the fuel and the fire. Let's start by looking at that maintaining fuel breaks. As an animal like this grazes along, they're using herbaceous biomass to fuel their bodies. And we could use that grazing force to create a fuel break. To do that, we would need something like temporary fences, electric fence, for example, water tanks or supplement to really concentrate animals in an area to reduce the biomass. The other thing that this critter can do for us is once a, a, a fuel break is put in by another process like mowing herbicides, maybe blading into making a, a brown area or tillage, all of those have to be maintained over time and grazing can be used to reduce the biomass um, between mowings or between tillage. Okay, when we think about tire, fire breaks, we often think about this, these fence line contrasts. These were taken in the Murphy Complex fire in 2007, and on the top figure, you, you see the classic, the fire is moving along and it hits a fence and it stops. And of course, that's what we'd like to see with a fire break is, is where it just stops because on the right-hand side of the fence, it was grazed. Uh, the bottom picture is the same, except sort of in the upper left-hand corner is the area that was grazed, and the fire grazed right up to that corner. Um, it's, it would be great to see these kind of fire breaks on the land, but oftentimes what's important is just to reduce the fire behavior, reduce the flame length and uh, the, the fire behavior so that the firefighters can get out there and actually um, reduce the fire and manage the fire. So there was some research done in Owyhee County a few years ago uh, by uh, Chris Jack Schneider, Ava Strand, Scott Jensen and myself, and the BLM really dug in and tried to help us figure out if you could use grazing to manage fuel, fuel loads in a way that would create fire breaks that would reduce the, the fire behavior of those fuels. Okay, so we had um, targeted grazing with cattle. It's in Owyhee County, southeastern, uh, southwestern Idaho. We had two grazing regimes, what we would call low and moderate, and then we grazed both in the fall and the summer to see if you could start grazing earlier in the summer to affect fuel, fuel loads. And first of all, we found something that I think everybody know. We, we looked at the fuel and then, then we actually, with the BLM's help, set fires and looked at fire behavior. But when we're looking at the fuels, nothing fancy here. Um, it doesn't matter whether it was grazed in the summer or the fall. When you graze, you reduce fuels. Um, also, these uh, grazed characteristics are showing that uh, any grazed pasture, whether it was grazed in the summer or the fall, is less than the control, which is the left-hand bar. Secondly, grazing uh, also reduced grass height, which could change fire behavior. Uh, we had two sites. The Mountain Big Sagebrush had quite a lot of biomass, and if you look on the right-hand two charts, yeah, we, we were able to reduce fuels by grazing less, and, and the fuels were less than the control bar. But one thing that we learned was that uh, when you have a site that has a lot of annual grass and not much grass, it's rather difficult to use grazing to, uh, to really kind of reduce that to an even lower level. Another very interesting thing, these were in sagebrush ecosystems. And if you look at the percent of shrub cover, that was having a huge influence. Uh, we knew it w would, but we found out that when you have grazing um, in, a, in an ecosystem that's sagebrush covered, you can con control flame length, you can reduce flame length of the fire uh, till about less than 20% shrubs. Once you get more than 20% shrubs, it's the shrub cover that's controlling the flame length and the amount of reduction in herbaceous matter with targeted grazing just wasn't influential. So targeted grazing has a place, but probably not after you're in very um, thick, st excuse me, thick stands of sagebrush. There was some research done quite a few years ago. I, I never thought you could use grazing to control cheatgrass fuel loads because fire goes so easily through cheatgrass. This work was done by Diamond, Colin, and um, back in 2019, I'm sorry, 20, 2009 in um, Utah. And what they have, they had these plots that were um, grazed and burned or not grazed and burned. The dark bars are not grazed and burned. These were pretty solid cheatgrass stands. And as the fire came along and got to that zero point, then it hit a point where uh, areas were grazed or not. At first, of course, there's no effect, but after just five meters, 
we see the fire flame length being much higher in the area that was not grazed than the area that was grazed. So, you know, just take home messages that even in really dense cheatgrass, we could have an influence on fire behavior by using targeted grazing. From the Murphy complex again, let's talk a little bit about reducing fuel to reduce fire intensity. This was a photo taken by Mike Pellant when he flew over the the Murphy complex area, and he, this just tells a great story. In the left-hand side, there was an area where the fire was moving along in ungrazed sagebrush, and uh, it was really hot. You can see that's a very black area before that um, yellow line, and then it moved into an area that was ungrazed but it was a seeded area. You can kind of see the tillage marks there going near the fence line. And the fire was still going along really well. It was getting a little patchier, but still pretty black. Then it hit a fence that was grazed and seeded. So it was still a seeded area with some perennial grasses, but it was grazed. And what happened was that fire just kind of fingered out into the grazed area. And so we can see that it really reduced its, um, the, the fire behavior was really changing and it really reduced its intensity and just fingered out into that grass. Some other great pictures we have on this, I'll show some data, but um, Kirk Davies and his colleagues out at Burns, Oregon have done some incredible work. And even um, when you have an area that was um, grazed and then burned uh, 15 years post fire, you see some really cool uh, results. On the left hand side it was grazed and the, the fire intensity was apparently low enough, the heat was low enough that those uh, perennial grasses survived fire and even quite a few shrubs survived fire. On the right hand side it was an area that had not been grazed before the fire and 15 years later the cheat grass has really taken over because the fire was more intense and it really um, took out many of the perennial grasses and of course took out their competition and it was a great, great place for cheat grass to come in. So um, Dr. Davies' uh, kind of take home messages from that res result research was that um, if you don't have grazing, it promotes cheatgrass invasion and it can decrease the native herbaceous um, plants in that area. Um, and then moderate livestock grazing, even just moderate well uh, managed livestock grazing can promote the positive response after the fire. And it suggests that really low severity disturbances um, may moderate the effects of potentially more severe disturbances. So that's way on that left hand side. If you just have managed or prescribed graving, even that can have an influence on the, inf on the effects of fire. Um, again, from Dr. Davies work, here's just a picture of what that, the reasons behind that. What are the causal factors? Accumulation of litter in the ungrazed area, the distribution of litter, especially right around the crown, some Plants like Idaho fescue have a, a lot of uh, stems right very close together. And of course they accumulate um, herbaceous uh, litter right around their crowns, which can be uh, deadly to those marrow stems at the base of the plant. So you can decrease the herbaceous vigor of those plants after fire if they're not grazed. Going with that, an idea that kind of another thing that Dr. Davies looked at was that fuel continuity. So maybe grazing is affecting the amount of fuel, but it might also be affecting the continuity of fuel. Again, from that work, um, what Dr. Davies found, if you looked at a grazed or not grazed area, um, the grazed area had um, less perennial grass. This included the litter. So the non-grazed area had more litter, including the, the live material and the the perennial grass uh, was more green and had less litter in the grazed area. The other thing he found was when you had grazing, it re increased the distance between the plants. There were more gaps between the plants. So maybe that's just a way that the herbaceous fuel could be reduced and reduced the fuel continuity, which would be important in slowing the spread of fires, the rate of spread of fires. Other interesting work done um, out at the Burns Experiment Station by France Ganskop and Boyd were looking at where cattle eat and what they found, again, no surprise to cattlemen out on the ground, but it hadn't been measured that as animals go into pasture, the first thing they eat is between the plants. So that upper line with this, the open circles is um, the amount, uh, the percent of plants grazed in the inner spaces between the shrubs. And you'll see that the cattle started out grazing those right away and always focused their energy on 
the areas between plants and it wasn't until about 10 or 12 days into this trial that we started seeing a pretty big increase in the reduction of plants under the shrubs. So again this is, might be a way that we could change fuel continuity between shrubs, maybe change the rate of spread of, of fires. Let's turn to another uh, topic then that would be to reduce annual grasses. Um, annual grasses of course are, are really a problem especially in the Great Basin because they extend the fire season. Seasons start earlier and last longer. They're very highly flammable so that they increase sort of the probability that uh, something that might not start a fire will start a fire with cheatgrass because of that highly flammable or lightable fuel. And then they grow in between the plants. In this picture you can see there's perennial grass bunches and there's shrubs there but in between them is that cheatgrass and that's increasing the fuel continuity. So what can we do about that? We know that grazing can promote annual grass invasion. We can absolutely overgraze areas and, um, and leave space and reduce uh, competition so that it makes a home for both cheatgrass and medusa head, which are two annual grasses that we try to manage. Grazing could stop invasion. There are several examples of that. Um, also in many areas that are spring grazed and then animals move off after the spring, uh, that can have lower um, invasion of shrubs. Um, grazing does not always reduce annual grasses though. It can in some cases or it can promote them in other cases. It just depends on the season or the amount of available moisture that comes after the grazing. So here's my summary of all the research that I've read is that I think if you have no grazing, a lot of research says that um, the, the cheatgrass will increase because it has this really unique niche of of starting earlier in the season, greening up before the perennial grasses. So it generally has a kind of an ecological edge over the perennial ecosystems that we manage. If you graze early in the spring, there's evidence, and I'll show you some data, where you can reduce the cheatgrass um, because you can graze it early in the spring and get off of it before those perennial grasses start to burn or start to grow. And so that can reduce the cheatgrass. At peak biomass, if you start to graze um, when those perennial grasses are blooming and flowering, that usually gives an advantage back to the cheatgrass because what you're doing is you're suppressing the competition. And then more recent work that's being done is, is looking that even during the dormant season, dormant season grazing can have an influence on cheatgrass. Here's a kind of cool graph that came out of Nevada um, with uh, Davidson and colleagues. And they were trying to look at whether you could use grazing to improve restoration techniques. And it was a pretty pretty solid cheatgrass stand. They started 2000. They had one site that was grazed by sheep and the one that wasn't grazed. And then by 2001 you could see that the sheep had done a pretty good job on the cheatgrass. There was very little. 2002 was a really good cheatgrass year and so there was still was less cheatgrass in the grazed area than not. But here's kind of the downside of this story is in 2002 they removed the sheep and by 2003 that effect of previous sheep grazing really did not affect the cheatgrass. The cheatgrass came, up, came right back. So I think we could use early spring grazing to manage cheatgrass, but you'd have to do it for quite a few years until you get a lot of the seeds out of the seed bank. And you'd have to be pretty careful um, because if you get moisture after the grazing, the cheatgrass will take an advantage of that moisture. Interesting Medusa head, which most people think is just totally unpalatable. Um, when it's young, it has some palatability and some really good work out of uh, um, California by Di Tommaso and colleagues showed that um, if you had an ungrazed site, it had more cheatgrass than whether the site, if the site was grazed in March. But if you waited a little bit further um, and, and grazed it in, in April or May, you had an even more profound effect and could reduce that amount of, uh, of Medusa head in a grazed pasture. So even really terrible annual grasses like Medusa head could be grazed uh, into some level of submission. Fall grazing I think is sort of the new uh, idea on the block. Um, in 2012 with some of the early um, pic pictures of work that was done in the Upton Mountains of Oregon by Barry Perryman and colleagues, many people involved in this research, and they um, had noticed that on many pastures that were grazed in the fall uh, there wasn't as much cheatgrass. It kind of defied logic but they decided to give it a try. So in 2012 you see that top picture. Then they established fall grazing and just a few years later you see a uh, really abundance of perennial grasses. Okay of course this is 
a, a real poster child of that fall grazing wood. This has been um, pretty widely applied across the Great Basin with some real, real success. Uh, one of the advantages of grazing in the fall is we have a really good idea of how much um, biomass there is, so we can really use targeted grazing with pretty good ideas of how much fuel is there and, and what we can accomplish with how many animals. So kind of take home messages. One, grazing can reduce fuels. Pretty much that's been proven worldwide. Second, grazing does not stop fires under hot and dry conditions. I showed you some great pictures of the Murphy Complex that were fence line contrasts, but the bigger story of Murphy Complex was it was really hot, it was really windy, it was really dry, and grazing really didn't have a profound effect across that 500,000 acres of area that land that uh, burned. Uh, then finally, uh, grazing can reduce cheatgrass and grazing can in increase cheatgrass. It just depends on your skill as a manager, and I gave you some tips on what to look for there. So grazing can reduce fuel intensity and promote recovery after fire. I think we're still digging into some of those details. I hope that gives you something to think about. Um, go ahead and give me an email sometime if you've got some uh, more information to share. My email is range at uidaho.edu. And thank you so much for this opportunity.